Throughout history, humor has served as a powerful means of affecting social change. Public humor, used wisely, can help undermine the status quo, unseat the elite, and erode stereotypes. But what happens when a substantial part of the population isn't allowed to participate in the construction of public humor? Throughout U.S. history, very few women have been able to gain prominence as comedians. Those who were accepted came to fame by reinforcing long-standing stereotypes of women as primarily childlike, silly, and dependent. Clearly, times have changed. Women in comedy today are given the latitude to speak independently as female without having to dress ridiculously and without having to take on a demeaning persona. Steve Carell's fox catcher look took two hours to put on, including his hairstyling and makeup. Just for comparison, uh, it took me three hours today to prepare for my role as human woman. Tina Fey and Amy Poehler are among a number of modern female comedians, hosting the Golden Globes as a team three years in a row. When did it become acceptable for a woman to stand in front of a crowd with no man by her side and crack a joke about the absurdity of her society? What's changed? Fanny Bryce was one of a very small number of female comedians of the early 20th century, but she got her laughs and her fame from pretending to be a child. Fanny started her career in burlesque shows. She headlined in Zigfield Follies from 1910 to 1911 and soon moved to radio starring in The Baby Snook Show. From 1944 to 1951, thousands of listeners tuned in each week to hear Fanny as the naive and wide-eyed but adorable Snooks. With her curled hair, big bow, and frilled clothing, Snooks played a mischievous toddler who was 40 years younger than Fanny herself. I saw mommy cry. You did? Uh-huh. The time my mommy saw my daddy kiss the nice goodbye. <laughs> the arrival of television brought many comedians and comedy shows into American homes. And the vast majority of comedians were male. Viewers encountered only a small number of female comedians although a few of these women became very popular with American audiences. Most of them played characters, or rather caricatures, that both created and reinforced common and negative stereotypes of women. Gracie Allen, part of a husband and wife comedy team, made a successful transition from radio to television, co-starring in Burns and Allen from 1950 to 1958. Look. Oh, George, for me? Uh-huh. Oh, you're the sweetest husband in this whole house. <laughs> Much like Snooks, Gracie's character was a sweet, naive, earnest, though slightly dim wife. With her unsophisticated character, Gracie was a great comedic foil for her older, wiser, and wisecracking husband, George Burns. Another early comedian, Phyllis Diller, also mined the role of wife for her material. Diller played a shrill, incompetent, neglectful housewife, and she derived many laughs from her seeming inability to keep either her house or her own appearance in good order. Many of her jokes revolved around her own experience and maturity, highlighting the importance of age discrimination surrounding women in media. I'll tell you what I really, really want. I want to look 65 again, <laughs> like I did when I was 30. Perhaps the most famous comedian of the era was Lucille Ball. She co-starred, along with her husband, Desi Arnaz, in I Love Lucy, which ran from 1951 to 1957 and was the highest rated series on television for four of its seasons. Lucy, like almost every other female comedian of her time, mined the role of wife for her comedic material. Almost as incompetent as a wife and housekeeper as Phyllis Diller, Lucy was also a far less cerebral character. Audiences were entertained with hilarious tales of Lucy's childish lack of judgment and common sense, and her harebrained schemes, domestic disasters that, week after week, Lucy's husband had to fix. <laughs> In short, most comedians of the 50s built their characters on caricatures of females. First, the naive little girl, and later the harebrained housewife, non-conforming housewife, shrill housewife, or dim housewife. It's no surprise that 1950s comedian Henny Youngman's most oft-quoted line brought audiences to laughter every time he uttered the words, Now you take my wife, please. <laughs> taking on new meaning in light of the narrowing roles that women were allowed to play. So, how did we get from then to now, when American audiences routinely encounter women comedians when they turn on their TVs? The transformation of women from prop to protagonist is due largely to the groundbreaking work of Elaine May, who, along with a group of students at the U of C, introduced audiences to a new, more cerebral, socially aware, and politically savvy type of humor. May moved from Los Angeles to Chicago in 1955, 
pursuing an education at the University of Chicago, where she audited classes and met Mike Nichols. The two considered themselves broke theater junkies and became early members of the Compass Players, an off-campus improvisational theater group, where they began writing and performing sketches together that expanded upon Viola Spolin's improvisational theater methods. The Compass Players grew in popularity and would eventually influence Chicago's Second City Improvisational Group, Saturday Night Live, and today's late night talk shows. Their new brand of humor was cynical and multidimensional. When I feel worst, I say to myself, at least the government has taken a firm stand. Oh, well, they can't fool around with this the way they did with integration. No. <laughs> uh, this is a, a sort It's of a bad. moral issue. Yes! A moral yes. issue. Yes, yes. That, it is a moral a issue. Moral and issue. To me, that's always so much more interesting than a real issue. Yeah. <laughs> they recognized and manipulated social and political structures for comedic purposes, puncturing their own self pretensions in order to shed light on current society. The duo left Compass Players to create their own stage act, Nichols and May, and grew incredibly popular in the late 50s. They began with radio sketches and nightclub performances. In short time, they were selling out performances at the Village Vanguard and the Blue Angel, hosting and appearing on TV. Their humor was wild due to its subtlety. They themselves never knew where the sketch was going, but they used variation in tone and body language to propel each other forward. Call up the doctor. Doctor. Um. <laughs> doctor? Mm. I have, uh, on the, um... Uh palms of my hands. I have an itch. I see. I have, a, I've been driving me crazy. I, uh -huh. I, I cannot stop scratching. Elaine's partnership with Mike Nichols was one of equality. Well, I better establish if there's more than one. Are you of different sexes? Uh, yes. <laughs> he was not her husband, nor her father, nor her patriarch in any way. Their platonic relationship was so unusual that it stumped the judges on the hit TV series, What's My Line? Uh, are you married? No. At seven down and three to go, Mr. Sir. Their impact on American comedy was profound, as was their impact on American women. Their humor helped undermine the comedy status quo by ignoring the dominant stereotypes of women and exploring new roles for women, like friend, intellectual partner, and working woman. While they didn't unseat the comedy elite, they certainly forced audiences to encounter new images of women and made room on stage for many more female comedians. The two worked together to create a satire that resonated with the educated class. Their language had a rousing exclusivity, a you-either-get-it-or-you-don't quality. Elaine may not only got it, but was it. This subtle yet important distinction is what makes her work groundbreaking. She introduced and solidified the woman's role among the educated elite, a throne in film and media usually reserved for the man. May and Nichols split in 1962 to pursue separate careers of screenwriting and directing. Nichols went on to direct popular films like Working Girl and The Birdcage, May was involved in the screenwriting and directing of a number of popular movies, including Heaven Can Wait and Heartbreak Kid. She is most famous for writing, directing, and starring in A New Leaf. May was an anomaly. She was a woman in media taking her career into her own hands by occupying positions of power in the business, such as writing, directing, and producing. In 1966, she and Nichols worked together to produce Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? In addition to writing, she continued to act in multiple films, including California Suite, In the Spirit, and Small Time Crooks for which she won the Best Supporting Actress Award from the National Society of Film Critics. By the 90s, May was mostly occupied with writing. She collaborated with Woody Allen and David Mamet in the writing of Death Defying Acts, and wrote the screenplay for Primary Colors, which earned a BAFTA Award and was nominated for an Academy Award. As with anything, change is not immediate, and it does not exist without exception. Her impact on American culture did not signify the absolute end of fetishizing and stereotyping women on stage. During Elaine's career and even after, Female comedians continued to hold expected roles in comedy, and thus continued to enforce female stereotypes. Goldie Hawn, on the 70s TV series Laugh-In, had to be funny by taking off her clothes and having her body written on. Lily Tomlin was funny in her role as a dumb telephone operator. Lane May is not a household name. Recent critics have argued that she was denied the acclaim of her male counterparts. However, Elaine's contributions are hardly dismissible. Her legacy and influence on comedy, for both men and women, is profound. Contemporary comedians were only able to develop their sophisticated and socially aware styles of humor as a result of Elaine May's revolutionary presence in female roles that were neither caricatures nor demeaning. They were simply female. Her ability to exist as a woman in comedy without falling into a predetermined category opened doors for women to explore all aspects of comedy without restriction.